After the worst nuclear disaster at Chernobyl, uh, the evacuation was exaggerated. Uh, about uh, five or ten times too many people moved out. After Fukushima, no one should have been moved. Not not 100,000, not 160,000. No one needed to move out of their homes. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective addressing important societal issues. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'm going to be continuing my series looking at nuclear power, the risks and the promises of nuclear power for uh, addressing climate change and providing uh, near limitless power for society. In this episode, uh, it's kind of a special date. Uh, We're in the middle of March 2021, and this is the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima Daiichi accident, uh, which was which occurred on March 11th, 2011, when a magnitude 9 earthquake and a uh, huge tsunami washed over the nuclear plant on the coast of Japan, uh, resulting in a, a meltdown of three of its four reactors. Interestingly, the Fukushima Daini nuclear plant doesn't get much press. It was 10 kilometers closer to the epicenter and was successfully shut down uh, during the devastation of the tsunami. But the Fukushima Daiichi plant resulted in Japan shutting down its nuclear uh, power plants. It resulted in a global response which slowed the adoption of nuclear had Germany uh, decided to shut down its entire nuclear industry and ramping up its coal. So the death toll from this accident was much greater than uh, what one might think from the radioactivity itself, which was decided to be relatively low in terms of its impact. The real impact was the fear response and the fact that it slowed the adoption of clean energy and increased the output of coal, which is known to kill people from the pollution and also from the climate change impacts. As always, if you enjoy the content that you're hearing, please press like uh, and share it with your friends Join the discussion. I'm opening up a new Facebook group. Uh, it's facebook.com slash group slash The Rational View. That'll be opening up on Pi Day 2021. I hope to see you there. Professor Philip Thomas has extensive experience in the chemical and nuclear industries with over 20 years experience at Imperial Chemical Industries in the UK and the UK Atomic Energy Authority, where he managed the Greenfield Decommissioning of the wind scale advanced gas cooled reactor. He moved into academia in 2000, taking up a chair in the engineering development at City University of London. The University of Bristol appointed him professor of risk management in 2015. He is a freeman of the city of London and junior warden of the worshipful company of scientific instrument makers, a city of London guild. He has published over 130 journal and conference papers on control, instrumentation, nuclear decommissioning, risk assessment, economics, and law. His book, Simulation of Industrial Processes for Control Engineers, was published in 1999. Professor Thomas, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you joining me uh, for this. I'm actually quite intrigued by your titles of a freeman of the city of London and junior warden of worshipful scientific instrument makers. Can you tell me what those are? Basically it's a, it's a, it's a charitable uh, institution. It's a, it's known as a closed uh, guild in the sense that you need to have something to do with measurement and control and instrumentation, data handling uh, in order to, uh, to qualify as a, uh, uh, as a member, as a liveryman, uh, as, ah. as we are known, uh, and it's uh, restricted to about 200, 200 people. Uh, the diversity uh, of uh, the people who are actually there, what, what they have done and what they are doing is, is extremely interesting. Very cool. And so as a liveryman, do you have a, a coat of arms for this group? 
Uh, the, I don't have a personal coat of arms, but yes, we do. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you look up uh, for short WCSIM uh, on the website, if you Google that, you, you'll see our coat of arms, which has actually got Newton and Faraday uh, as, uh, as prime uh, upholders of that, uh, of that coat of arms. Oh, very cool. <laughs> That's really neat. So let me get into our, our discussion here. So you are an expert on, on risk assessment and nuclear decommissioning and, and uh, looking at risks uh, surrounding uh, nuclear power and nuclear power accidents. As part of your research, you've developed a framework that enables objective decisions to be taken on expenditure to protect humans and the environment. This is a rare and precious thing. <laughs> I think uh, rationality in the public sphere of, of risk management and expenditures is, is typically out the window because it's being run by politicians in most cases and whatever uh, sells the best to the populace is, is, the, is the raison d'etre. Could you provide an overview for our listeners of the framework that you've developed? Yes, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Uh, it's, uh, we call it the J value, uh, J for judgment. Uh, and what we do is we first ask ourselves a question of what is it uh, that you stand to lose if you, if you lose your life? And it's not such, a, such an easy uh, question to answer. And the solution that we have come up with is to, that you lose something which is sort of measurable. Uh, it is the life expectancy that you can, you can expect to have from, from this point onwards. And it's different for different people. It's certainly different for different ages. So that the life expectancy that a young woman of 20 stands to lose by being killed in, a, in an accident, in a, in a car accident, for example, uh, that is a lot more, I mean, it will be something like 80, 85 years, something like that in the UK. Uh, that's a lot more uh, than she would stand to lose if she were to face the same accident 60 years later, when her life expectancy uh, would be something more like eight to 10 years. So uh, it's, um, uh, it, it is actually, it corresponds to something which is, which is measurable, uh, which is measured, has been measured uh, since, the, uh, uh, since the 17th century by another liveryman originally, incidentally. Uh, and we have statistics, we have actuarial statistics that, uh, mm, that, yes. that measure that. Now, the, the interesting thing is that, and the unique thing uh, for, for this method is that we can actually balance that against the cost of extending uh, that, that life uh, of, uh, of restoring, uh, of, of avoiding a risk and restoring the life to what it would have been in the absence of the risk. Uh, we can, um, and we do that uh, through this method called the J value, brings in a, a, a concept which is actually mathematically definable called risk aversion, uh, which is more or less what it says it is. Um, uh, people who are more risk averse uh, have a higher value of risk aversion. Um, and if we actually look at a country uh, like Japan, it has a life expectancy at birth of, around, of nearing 85 years. If you look at some uh, sub-Saharan, much poorer countries, then their life expectancy at birth is, is about 30 years less. Mm. But they are both taking, we can explain the decisions they're taking. They're both devoting a fraction, not all of their income, not all of their resource to trying to extend their lives. They've got other things to do as well, uh, other very important things to do. Um, but part of it they devote to extending their resource and we can explain 80% of the variation of, in life expectancy with gross domestic product per head, GDP per head. So we've actually got a totally rational basis uh, for for our recommendations. Okay, so this is uh, trying to put a, a monetary equivalent, as it were. Uh, and I know I've I've looked at actuarial tables before, and and uh, in, in it seems cold and and you know putting numbers on life, but people will say you know the average worth of a human life is ten million dollars for example, for actuarial calculations. Is that something like what this is doing? 
It's something like it. Um, and, um, and what you say in as far as $10 million is concerned is not too bad uh, an estimate uh, from, from our perspective. The trouble with those estimates, there are two problems with those estimates. One, they actually put the same value on the 80 years, 80 year old woman's life as, as a 20 year old former self. Uh, which we would contend is inaccurate. It's rough and ready. Uh, it's it's better than nothing, uh, but it's not terribly accurate. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. The second thing is it's very difficult uh, to measure. And in the UK, people have tried to measure that, and they've tried to be scientific about it. But we found that when they do so, they can't. There are major flaws in their reasoning. And we've actually found in the standard, uh, the standard exercise, uh, which is used by the UK government, which actually incidentally puts a value of about two million pounds on a life, a lot less than the ten million dollars that you're talking about, then uh, that was that's actually invalidated by its own data. So um, there are real problems. Whereas the J value, it doesn't rely on anyone's subjective judgment. Uh, it relies totally on data. All its parameters come from data, uh, from data right across the world, across the whole of our, uh, uh, from 180 out of, out of 200, 193 uh, nations who are registered with the UN, uh, they all conform to the same basic law. And so we think that we've actually got something which is objective, uniquely, it's entirely objective, it's entirely data-driven, there is no aspect of subjectivity in it. And this is this linking um, life to economic productivity in some way then? No, it's not in the sense that, not in, that's not in a direct sense. No, so we don't, what we do is uh, our ethical stance, or the J values ethical stance, I should say, is to value the next day of life the same for everyone. So we value everyone's life expectancy, rich or old, rich or rich or rich or, or, or poor, young or old, the same. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So this this is a very interesting approach, and I, I really like the idea of the rational approach to risk management. And it's one of the reasons that I've got into this podcast and the rational view is 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 that I'm aghast at at risk management in politics and in the social sphere. <laughs> but for this particular episode, I wanted to focus a little bit on uh, the Fukushima accident. The, the Great Japan Earthquake and Tsunami uh, mm. occurred March 11th, 2011, and, and we're almost now 10 years to the day uh, of that occurrence. Uh, and at the 10th anniversary, I thought it fitting to review the event and its impact with an expert. Now, you have recently led a team applying the J-value, uh, which you've just described to us, and complementary techniques to gauge how best to cope with a big nuclear accident such as Chernobyl or Fukushima. Could you uh, please summarize for our listeners uh, you know, what happened at Fukushima and the string of events that uh, you've analyzed? Well, Fukushima, uh, it, it happened in... Uh, uh, 10 years ago this week, they had uh, an enormous earthquake, uh, one of the worst earthquakes they've, they've ever had, if not the, the worst earthquake. And that led to uh, a follow on a tsunami. And, the, <clears throat> and that hit the, the plant, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi plant uh, in, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, and they shut down. Uh, when they detected the earthquake and that was all fine. Uh, and so they'd gone into a state where they were being cooled uh, to get rid of the decay heat. Um, but 45 minutes after they had shut down, they were hit by uh, this enormous tidal wave. What it did is it knocked out the cooling systems, knocked out the cooling pumps, uh, knocked out the cooling systems that you need on a reactor. Uh, the, uh, the reactors uh, overheated, um, they melted, uh, the, the fuel melted, uh, it was contained within the plant, um, but there were gases that escaped uh, and particulate that, that escaped, some particulate escaped, not, and, um, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this, there were actually hydrogen explosions, not nuclear explosions, uh, but hydrogen explosions, uh, which vented this to the, 
to the outside world. Uh, about 110,000 people were told that they needed to evacuate, uh, and which which they which they did, uh, and uh, they were joined by about 45 to 50,000 of their uh, of people who were living nearby who hadn't been told to evacuate. Uh, but decided to do so anyway. So it was around about 160,000 in total of people evacuated. And so we, we, we examined that. I, I, I led a, it was actually a multi-university uh, study. Uh, at my own university, I used the uh, J-value method to look at it. Uh, others, uh, the, uh, other universities, Manchester used optimal economic uh, control. Uh, to, to look at the problem uh, and uh, the Open University looked at another, they, they had a collaboration with Public Health England and they looked at their codes. And the extraordinary thing is, and we were looking at this in 2012, a year after Fukushima, uh, the extraordinary thing is that we all came, all these things were coming to the same conclusion, which surprised us, uh, which was that it was not a good idea to evacuate people from uh, a, after a big nuclear, the worst, some of the, well, the worst nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. Uh, the evacuation was exaggerated. Uh, about uh, five or 10 times too many people moved out. After Fukushima, no one should have been moved. Not, not 100,000, not 160,000. No one needed to move out of their homes. The first thing that I think our study actually showed uh, was um, that people should be aware that you should be biased against moving people out. In almost no severe nuclear accidents should you be, should you be moving uh, people out, certainly not many people. That's, that's mm -hmm. the first thing. But then if then we then come to information uh, and uh, the information could be better, the information was actually gathered by people uh, flying around in helicopters and uh, and, find, and and taking radiation measurements, and that's 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 fair enough. We have uh, we've looked at ways of improving on that, uh, and I think that would be the next phase of what I would like to see happening, because you can prove, improve on that. Uh, physics is uh, physics and technology have have moved on. We now have drone technology, and I have a colleague uh, at Bristol. Uh, Professor Tom Scott, uh, who has demonstrated uh, flying drones over nuclear facilities, including out of Fukushima, and doing incredibly detailed mapping uh, of the uh, of of the radionuclides uh, that are contaminating the, the ground. Uh, he's flown over uh, a disused uranium mine in Cornwall, uh, and, and and produced a very very detailed map over quite a wide area. So it's potentially possible in the future to do far, far better. We have the information, we could use the, that information, we could translate that information on, on contamination into life expectancy uh, harm that would be done, uh, and we can do the whole job, and we can keep people informed in real time on an app on their phones. Oh, wow, yeah, that would be really cool. So just... To, to take a, a, a step back and look at the bigger perspective, what what was the harm that resulted from this accident and from the evacuation? Can you summarize, you know, how many people died, how many people were got cancer, what 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 happened and what was the result of those actions? Uh, well, no no one died uh, as a result of uh, radiation exposure. The harm that was done, uh, was actually the be best uh, es estimate we have of the harm that was done was about 2,000 uh, people uh, in uh, who were in um, old people's homes and uh, old, older people uh, were moved out uh, and about over 2,000 of those died prematurely, earlier than you would have expected that a similar cohort to die uh, within the next three years. Uh, and, and we've looked at the life expectancy that was lost uh, and, and so on. Uh, so the, the net effect uh, of, of the evacuation, not of the accident, but of the evacuation uh, was uh, to cause some premature deaths. Mm -hmm. the, um, 
if we think ab about the harm, well, uh, we can translate the uh, radioactive dose that people receive. We now have measurements of, quite good measurements of the radioactive dose, the, uh, uh, the UN, the uh, United Nations Standing Committee on, uh, uh, on the effects of atomic radiation has done some uh, very good work in this area. We can use that uh, to estimate not what dose people did receive, they, they did, well, we have that as well, and, and they, they received uh, small amounts of, of radioactive uh, um, of dose um, and uh, radiation dose, but very, very small indeed in, in, in the level of one or two uh, millisieverts, which would have very little effect on them at all. One, um, or, one or two millisieverts, just to put it in perspective, is on the order of a typical background annual dose. Yes. At, at background radiation, that area is around about two millisieverts per year. So yes, exactly so. Um, and but we found that the that if um, if the people had uh, had stayed in the worst affected town, which was Tomioka, uh, there were sixteen thousand people there. They were all moved out. If they had stayed there, uh, then the they could expect to have lost uh, over the next. You know, till to the end of their lives, basically over the next seventy years, uh, we, we were looking at that sort of time period, uh, around about uh, two to three months uh, of life expectancy, which is rather small. I mean, we would actually, we we would not recommend when we applied the J value to that. We we came at the J value. If you, if you get a, a value um, which is above above one. Uh, then uh, you are spending too much. And, and the J values are coming out uh, were above one, not hugely above one. Uh, it might've been something like 1.5 1, 1. Uh, or two, uh, something like that. So we would be thinking about uh, starting to move people out at, at that sort of level, but not so. Um, but if you, but to, uh, to put that in perspective, this, the J value is a very sensitive tool and, it, uh, and, and it, it puts a very high premium on people's life to come. If you, I mean, I, I spent 15 years in, in London. London at the moment, the average Londoner is losing four and a half months life expectancy to air pollution. And yet no one uh, is, uh, is asking for London or the inhabitants of London uh, to be evacuated. That's an interesting statistic. So this is the the particulates in the air from fossil fuel burning and diesel and all of these things have a measurable impact on the inhabitants of London, which is roughly twice what the inhabitants of, of that town would have incurred by staying there. Yeah, so I can tell, uh, if I can tell a slightly amusing um, story uh, of that, um, and uh, a sort of media story of, of that. Uh, when when our um, when our results were published, there was there was media interest in, in our work, and the Times the Times of London uh, uh, carried carried the story. Um, that was picked up by the Evening Standard, uh, and one of the things they had said in the in the Times of London, they had said uh, they had more or less said that they used that statistic uh, that the pollution uh, after Fukushima. Uh, in the worst affected town was less than the pollution in London. The, uh, um, uh, from the London Evening Standard had picked up that story there, a sort of afternoon evening paper, had picked up on the story and switched it round and said, living in London is the same as living in a nuclear disaster area. So they had got their headline, they got their striking headline, it was the same information, and they chose to see that that way round. Uh, and so uh, it's, uh, and yet they weren't, they weren't entirely wrong at all. I mean, there is, mm -hmm. there is an equality there. And of course, you need to do something about the pollution, which is, which is actually in London. So we don't, we don't say you shouldn't have done anything. You should have done something. I, I find it ironic. And I, I know that Tokyo is probably similar to London, that many of the people evacuated probably went to a more dangerous area uh, because of the fossil fuel pollution. And the fact that Japan following Fukushima, shut down all of their nuclear reactors and started burning more fossil fuels, they did. actually killed more people than would have ever um, been hurt uh, by the nuclear uh, accident. Yeah, I have, we haven't actually investigated that in precisely, but I know that um, uh, after Fukushima, 
uh, the nuclear power industry, which had been generating 25% of Japan's electricity. Um, by 2015, it was producing, it had gone down from 25% down to less than 1%. Uh, the slack was picked up uh, by uh, the Japanese burning more uh, coal and natural gas and oil. Uh, and uh, those sources of energy, which were previously uh, producing about, about 55% uh, of Japan's electricity, they shot up to 80%. And um, they've started now to restart. They have now start very sort of gingerly begun the restart of their nuclear industry. Uh, and uh, so they're now producing about 6% of their electricity through nuclear. Uh, they're uh, producing about 7% through, through uh, so, uh, solar PV. Uh, and uh, so through renewables, very little wind, but a little bit of wind. And uh, the result is that the fossil fuel uh, production has fallen from 80% down to 70%, but it's still significantly higher uh, than it was uh, before the accident. Yeah, it's, it's these, these type of irrational knee-jerk decisions that, that I like to hold up to a light. I find often that nuclear risks are held up to a very bright light, uh, while the alternative to avoiding nuclear is commonly not looked at. And, you know, you have to look at the cost for avoiding nuclear. In, in Chernobyl, people said, well, look at all of these, all of these people that have died. But, it, you know, the people that have died in, in response to the Chernobyl accident were actually dying because of the fall of the Soviet Union and the fact that they've lost all their services and their medical industry and, and their incomes. Uh, you don't compare apples and apples in a lot of cases. And I think that's one of the things that this J value seems to, to put into perspective is, is it's got a, a quantitative way of looking at the, the risks. So I, I liked your idea of using drones for, for getting information quickly. I think that's a very good idea. And I'm sure we're going to see that in response to future accidents. Um, well, I hope so, but I'm not sure. Um, I, I say that because uh, of the, I think the nuclear industry is uh, is a very conservative industry. It's also something of a of an industry that's been battered by public relations, and I think there are two there are two sort of uh, attitudes in the nuclear industry. One to get out there and address the problem, uh, and try and solve a problem, and and tell people, educate people, tell them what what what's actually happening, and, and so on. Um, and, and try to convey the real picture in the, in the best way in which, uh, which they can. That's on the one side. I think on the other side, say, well, let's just keep our heads down uh, and hope that the problem eventually goes away. Um, I, I don't actually believe, I don't actually belong to that camp. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, the nuclear industry should be uh, moving out there and actually saying this. But it, as I say, it's very conservative. So one, when in, uh, in the UK, when we've, uh, uh, when we've advocated uh, these methods, uh, we've had uh, not sort of only a slight interest. We've had a lot more interest. One of the sponsors for this, uh, uh, one of the sponsors for this technology was India, which wants to increase its nuclear power very considerably. Uh, and they, they have shown a very strong interest in taking this further. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's not going to happen on its own, uh, but it is, uh, it is, as you, I think, uh, think and believe, uh, is that, that it, is, it has the potential uh, to, to make a very big difference to the way in which people perceive nuclear. Do you um, provide guidelines in your paper about, you know, at what level of radiation, for example, people should be removed from their homes i know as you say in the in the fukushima area the the increased radiation is similar to the background radiation but japan has a very low um official safety level for radiation uh and so they reacted differently than say a different municipality with a higher limit and th these limits i don't know exactly where they come from and i don't think they've been thought out rationally as as we say if if the limits were rational, every city in the world would be evacuated due to the <laughs> due to the smog. 
they they come really from I, I think if you ask them to explain why they have set upon their limits, I think they would they would not be able to take you very far. They they sort of feel it's right, uh, and and looking at them, uh, they have some um, some rationale. But the the only rationale that we can give them is to actually apply the J value to them and then see if they're they're okay. Uh, and there is there is nothing else that can can actually do that. So um, yes, uh, I, I think I think the whole whole area of limits needs to be looked at. I think the um, the current limits are mainly set uh, using the precautionary principle and not based on any particular scientific data that suggests a risk. They are basically saying, well, this is the background level. Let's not increase it because we don't know if there's a risk of increasing it. I I I, I would I would broadly agree with that. I think they take that as a sort of reference point. Um, if you look at uh, yeah. theories of how risk or how radiation causes cancer or causes health risks, there are multiple different uh, schools of thought. One, the, the worst case is what they call the linear no threshold theorem, where any particular radioactive decay can cause cancer and it's just a rule of the dice. There's no, um, and ev every bit of radiation is potentially deadly in this thought. And then there's the other side, which suggests that it's a there's a threshold a below, below which the body deals fine with uh, radiation damage and any sort of low doses in the region of the background or maybe uh, 10 times the background really don't have a measurable effect at all on health. And because cancer is something that is relatively prevalent in society, the statistical differences to tiny doses of radiation just can't be teased out. Um, is that does that affect the, the, the rational response depending on which of these models is correct? It, well, it would certainly. And, and I think you've, you've given a very, sum, a very good summary of, of the situation. I know that I, I attended a conference a couple of years ago uh, out, out in America where there was a, a, an argument which was being uh, pursued where it was suggested uh, that anything below something like um, the 100 millisieverts, which is 50 times background radiation in Japan and also in the UK, incidentally, uh, that that uh, that they, they they thought some uh, one set of people thought that was, would make no difference. Uh, what we uh, what we do with the J values, we take the uh, recommendations of the. ICRP, this International uh, Commission on Radiological Protection, we take those, uh, we, we believe that they are conservative, but we build those into our models uh, and uh, we apply the J value to, to those. So what I've said about three months life, two or three months life expectancy uh, being at stake um, by moving or not moving uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Tomioka town, uh, that, that's with the ICRP uh, coefficients uh, applied to that. And, and what we say is that I think that in, but that in itself, I think is a very, irrespective of the J value, I think that that in, in itself is a very useful statistic for people to see. I think if people had seen that coming out on their phones or so far you so far we calculate you might you might have lost three weeks um in, in in total life expectancy i think that would have put it very much in perspective so in the in the aftermath of fukushima we had as you say about two thousand people died due to the evacuation yes. and nobody died due to the radiation and this is the crux of the problem in terms of the, the societal response to radioactive releases or uh, nuclear accidents. It's that uh, the fear is the enemy, not the actual radiation. It's very, it's very difficult to kill someone with radiation. Uh, you have to really get it inside them and have it sit there for a long time. And as you say, there are things that can be done to prevent uptake of, of radioactive debris and clean it out. And, you know, the best thing to do is sit in place in most cases. You know, this is the worst case possible scenario you could think of that happened at Fukushima, and the, the fourth largest earthquake in the history of recorded history, and a huge tsunami and a triple meltdown, and mm -hmm. nobody was killed by the radiation. The containment basically worked. There was a small release due to a hydrogen explosion, 
which, oh. which scattered this around. And the amount of radiation that came out was not enough to, to kill people or, or have a very negligible effect. Uh, no, no acute radiation sickness was uh, occurred. Uh, and then the question is, what is the long-term risk of this added radiation? And it's obviously a hotly debated, a hotly debated thing. But we've got to this situation where we've made mistakes, I think, in communicating risk to the public as, as scientists and technical people somehow we failed to communicate the risks adequately. And there's a, this fear response that is killing people that is actively hurting people. You know, we have a rational approach and we have what actually happens. How did we get here and how do we fix it? Well, um, I think the, the first thing is knowledge. Uh, Charles Dickens, um, back in Victorian times, uh, identified ignorance as one of the uh, worst evils, uh, and, and he wanted people to be educated. So I think there's, there's enormous ignorance about the true, rather low uh, effects uh, of radiation in the quantities which we can reasonably expect ever to face, even after the worst, as you say, the worst nuclear accident uh, ever. The worst nuclear accident ever was, was actually Chernobyl. We tell people our best knowledge. We try to place that, that knowledge in a way which people will understand. I don't think anyone understands, for instance, uh, millisieverts as the, the effect of them. They have to translate that into something. At the moment, I think many of them translate it into something which is rather fuzzy. Um, we can translate it. We and Walter Marshall before us could translate that into loss of life, uh, loss of life expectancy. That I think people can understand. And um, to give you an, give you an example, um, we have looked at uh, we looked at the case uh, of the uh, food ban, which had been in place in the UK um, from uh, for the whole of the twenty five years between from Chernobyl in nineteen eighty six. Uh, to, uh, to past Fukushima in 2011. Uh, it was only lifted in 2012. This is on LAM. This is on uh, LAM, which uh, was where the uh, lamb was raised, uh, the sheep were raised uh, on uh, hills in Wales uh, and Scotland and Northern England. And because of the Chernobyl spread of uh, low quantities of radioactivity, uh, across uh, in contamination right right across Europe um, had a had a very very small effect, but it was, I mean we think we calculate for example that, that uh, the average UK citizen would have lost four hours to the uh, to the fallout from Chernobyl. Uh, we have done that calculation, um, and but they they actually but in okay they they thought this would concentrate in lambs we didn't do the calculation we weren't uh, set up to do the calculation in 1986 but we could actually do the calculations in 2012 and when we looked at those looked at that and found the residual um, the residual risk was that if someone had at exclusively um, lamb produced, the most radioactive lamb produced on the most radioactive uh, uh, lamb, uh, sheep uh, that, that uh, came down from the hills uh, and uh, at prodigious amounts of lamb. It, there couldn't be too many of such people, by the way, because there wasn't enough lamb, but nevertheless, <laughs> if this, this happened, um, then uh, that person uh, might uh, lose four hours of life expectancy. Wow. And if, if, uh, if it had been spread across the sort of consumption of the whole of the UK, the life expectancy lost would have been uh, measured uh, in microseconds. That, that's on the order of like, you know, walking by someone smoking a cigarette. Yeah, I expect so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Of, that, of, that, of that order. Yes, exactly. And, and I mean, they, they, they are such palpably ludicrous figures that one comes up with. And I think people can look at that and say, well, Gosh, no, that, that's 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 too much. But that that ban was actually kept in place uh, when that was when that was happening. It's now has now been lifted. But that's the sort of thing you can do. Uh, again, irrespective of the J value, if you just work with life expectancy, it's an extremely powerful statistic. Mm. It'd be interesting to calculate the actual 
um, loss of life expectancy from the evacuation to a more polluted area. <laughs> I mean, you've actually that did happen. Uh, that, 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 well, we could we could do one of those things because that, that happened. Um, it, it actually one of the uh, one of the evacuation spots uh, after Fukushima. Uh, actually uh, gained them an extra dose of about uh, four or five millisieverts because they've moved to a slightly more polluted area. Um, so that did actually happen there. That was easy to look at. It was uh, deleterious to move where they'd moved to. Or, or, or moving to Tokyo where the, the air pollution is worse. Uh, yes, yes, that's um, that, that too. Again, we haven't done a calculation, but that too, potentially, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think that you know, the public is reacting to the actions of governments and, and believing that, you know, in a rational sense, nuclear must be horrible because, look, we're going to these polluted cities rather than staying put. Um, so a rational person would see this action and interpret nuclear as being worse. Something must be being hidden from us. Yes. Why would they evacuate us if there's no danger? I think that's I think that's exactly right. In fact, the J value allows you to sort of have a sort of insight in, into what you have just said. Uh, it gives you another explanation for it because it does it does say there is a there is an equivalence between uh, what people would ideally spend uh, on safety uh, and 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 the uh, the amount of hazard which it's uh, which it's 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 um, uh, risk which it, which it, which it's uh, taking away. And that, um, and if you think of someone, I mean, if you think of the, the, the average person at, at, at Chernobyl who was uh, seeing his government, I mean, the people around Chernobyl, they're not certainly weren't, weren't, des weren't desperately prosperous, certainly not by Western standards. Uh, and they, they would have seen uh, their government, which they found hadn't really taken too much notice of them before, but suddenly they were spending like it's no tomorrow. And I think exactly your thought that they would think either that we're being saved from something terrible or, and there's evidence for this, uh, they thought, well, we're being paid huge amounts of compensation uh, by the government, which is flailing around trying to uh, keep us happy after the terrible fate that has now befallen us. And so we are now going to, uh, we, our lives will have been foreshortened. We will die young or certainly younger than we were when we, uh, what we expected to be when we died. And the, the result of that, of course, is that um, a large section of that population then um, indulged in uh, rather risky behavior uh, as a result. We'll say, we've got nothing to lose. So yes, I think that's right. I think it's, it is, that message does go out to people. Yeah, the lack of, of rigor in the, in the response is, is more damaging than the, the, act, or the, the accident itself. Um, so based on all of this and your, your research into relative risks and how to judge them, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on nuclear energy uh, going forward, knowing that there's a possibility of a further meltdown or nuclear accident, um, however slight, what's your opinion on nuclear energy in light of, of climate change concerns and fossil fuel burning and risks? How do you see this as a, is, is nuclear energy a solution uh, for some of this or should we be avoiding nuclear energy in the future? No, I think it's. I think it's necessary. I think it's the. Uh, it's the only uh, concentrated form uh, of uh, of uh, energy production uh, which can operate without producing uh, carbon at the, at the point of generation. Uh, so I, I think that uh, I mean the renewables have their place, but they are intermittent. Wind, uh, solar, uh, they are both uh, intermittent. Uh, but nuclear uh, is uh, is uh, can be uh, uh, is a a, uh, a pretty safe and, and secure way of, of producing energy, and we do need that, and we do need that to avoid uh, to avoid the uh, climate change that uh, that we are now all aware of, and and is and there's evidence, very good evidence, that it is happening. So yes, nuclear is 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 needed for that. I think that the nuclear industry uh, still faces an existential threat 
after Fukushima, Germany decided to move out of nuclear all. Uh, I actually say, I mean, I am party pre, I know, but I see no, uh, no way for it to address that uh, threat squarely unless it adopts the sort of methods, um, the J-value methods that, that we have, uh, have been using. That's very, very interesting. And I think it's something that needs more publicity. And I think we need to get um, these sort of analyses in front of decision makers and get the processes in place where people can make rational decisions in relation to risks. And I agree with you. I think the most rational way forward is that we need to expand nuclear energy massively um, to decrease the risk of fossil fuels on both the climate and on the, the local pollution and, and the livelihoods of people if we want to save lives and uh, make the world a better place. Uh, abundant high intensity energy sources are a requirement, I think. And yes, solar and wind help uh, to some extent, but they aren't going to do the heavy lifting we need to, to get rid of fossil fuels in the near future at least. So I think we're getting to the end of our time slot. I'd like to thank you for joining me and sharing your expertise with our listeners. This has been great. Uh, much appreciated, uh, Professor Thomas. Thank you for coming on The Rational View. Thank you. Pleasure. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.